Uh, good morning, and can I welcome everybody to the 21st meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2013, and welcome all members back to the committee after the summer recess. Uh, I hope everybody's had a, a good summer, uh, and hopefully a restful one, because we've got a lot of work on uh, over the next wee while, uh, particularly uh, with the uh, Children and Young People's Bill. So, uh, can I also remind all those present that uh, electronic devices should be switched off at all times, because they do interfere with the sound system. We have received apologies from Joan McAlpine this morning and Marco Biaggi is here uh, as uh, her substitute, so welcome uh, to Marco uh, and thanks for coming along. And can I just mention to everybody before we start uh, that this is uh, Neil Finlay's uh, last meeting uh, on this committee because he's moving on to Pastors, Pastors New. Promotions, is that a promotion? I think it probably is. <laughs> Some may say. <laughs> so uh, congratulations to Neil and I can I thank Neil formally um, on the record for his work uh, in this committee uh, since he joined us. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Neil. Um, agenda item one, our first item today is to decide whether to take agenda item three in private. Uh, are members agreed? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, our next item is to hear evidence on the Children and Young People Scotland Bill. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can I welcome to the committee Mike Burns from the Association of Directors of Social Work, uh, Professor Kenneth Norrie uh, from uh, University of Strathclyde, uh, Susan Quinn uh, from the EIS, and John Stevenson from Unison Scotland. Can I welcome all of you to the committee this morning? Uh, this is our second evidence session on the bill. Uh, we intend to cover the key, key principles of the bill and to consider how it would work in practice. And again, I thank the witnesses for their written submissions, which are, uh, have all been uh, very interesting indeed to read. Uh, and of course, we'll inform some of our questioning uh, this morning. Uh, before I move on to questions from other members, can I um, begin with a, uh, effectively a general question to uh, all of the panel this morning. What, in your view, uh, will be the practical effect of the proposed duties that are contained within the bill? For example, what real difference will the report writing duties make to children's lives? Um, so it's not a question really about the principle, but what practical effect will the bill have, in your opinion? Can I just go along the road? I'll start with you, John, if you don't mind. I think that that will very much depend. We would like the practical effect of that to be that you have an integrated plan for every child and that every child gets the help they need when they need it. Um, but as we say in the introduction to our response, that, that this is resource critical. Uh, so we need to know what kind of resources are going to be on the ground in order to do that and deliver that in real practice. Because we have uh, around, you know, social work, health, education are inundated uh, with reports and with forms and with assessments. Um, and we're actually pretty good, I think, in all of the services at assessing. Uh, what we're less good at is delivering uh, real practical help on the ground because that requires the resources uh, to be in place to do that. So the, the key bit for us is clarity as to how this will be funded. Uh, we'd support absolutely in principle uh, and good practice around Scotland and many authorities already have uh, the um, issue of integrated assessments and those kind of things working uh, to some level or another. Uh, it's not a huge step to take the next step in what the bill is talking about. Uh, what is a big step is we are going to uncover a whole lot of things we didn't already know about uh, that are going to require some kind of action, and that requires resources. Thank you very much. Susan? Yeah, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't disagree with, with John's um, assessment of what, what potentially can happen. Um, the ISC very clearly that there is potential in terms of a single um, assessment and plan for young people that carries across all of the services because certainly one of the, the challenges over the last few years has been the number of different ones and how they talk to each other and how that makes sure that our young people get the best service that's there. But in the backdrop of um, the, the cuts and the difficulties that we have within our service and across all of the, the services that are going to be working together, the actual plans need to in some way help to overtake the issue. That is that there's going to be fewer people in each of these different areas working on it. So we need to be clear about the, the need for the resources to make sure this takes place. And in particular in education, in a time when um, a range of other initiatives across other aspects of our 
um, performance will be being introduced as well. So it's not just the call for the named person to be the named person who delivers on uh, an education support plan in conjunction with other services, but um, the delivery of curriculum for excellence and the, the, the new qualifications and all of the other aspects of it. So resources are, are key to this. Resources are absolutely key, but the potential is there for better <coughs> communication with the, with within and across the services, if we can get that right. Thank you. Mike. Thank you. I, th I think echoing some of those points, I think that the, the duties within the, the, the bill will certainly, I think, consolidate getting it right for every child and also um, the aspirations of the Christie Commission. Um, I do think what is critical is the bit of work that Susan Deacon did in relation to early years where she talked about the fact that in Scotland, far too much time and attention has been focused on the plan and not enough on delivery. And we would like to see the bill as being critical leverage in terms of converting those aspirations into tangible outcomes for our most vulnerable children. Um, if, if the question is what is the practical effect that the bill is going to have, um, it seems, seems to me it's, root, it's almost impossible to give an answer at this stage, partly or mostly because there's so many ambiguities in the, in the terminology and the structure of the bill. Um, if, if the question is about the aspirations of what the bill is hoping to achieve, as far as I can understand it. It's about um, a, creating a, a, a changed culture, changing people's mindsets, changing the, the way that service providers across Scotland actually uh, uh, develop and deliver the services that they're set up to do, um, to put the, the well-being of children and young people at the forefront of everybody's everybody's minds, and if 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 we are able, to, if we as a society are able to achieve that change of mindset, then that that's wholly a good thing. As a matter of principle, whether legislation is the best way to go about achieving that mindset really depends upon the precise legal obligations and legal rights that the legislation encapsulates. Thank you very much. Um, before I open it up to members, I wanted to ask Professor Norrie a specific question on um, his written evidence on UNCRC incorporation. Um, could you expand on your view um, that you expressed in your written evidence about why you think it's, um, well, I think, is, that, is unwelcome too strong a word? UN Convention on the Rights of the Child itself is by no means unwelcome, and I would not it's like in to be interpreted <laughs> as suggesting it was. To incorporate it into the domestic legal system of Scotland, um, I, I, I think would be bad policy and bad practice and bad law. And the reason I say that is, is primarily um, because the UN Convention was not drafted and it's not worded to create enforceable, directly enforceable legal rights in the domestic legal system. And if you take a document that has been created for one purpose, which is very aspirational, it's got an aspirational purpose, att attempting to change mindsets <coughs> across the world, change governmental mindsets, so that children are at the forefront of the attention of all government policy, that's good. That's good. We want governments to be able to do that, and that's what the UN Convention tries to do. But that's how it's drafted. If you take a document drafted for one purpose and then try to uh, 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 pretend that it actually sets out strict legal rules that are enforceable in a court of law, you get all sorts of, of, of complexities and you give judges, for example, far more power, far more political power than, uh, 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 than we probably want them to have. Um, I might, if I could give, give some examples, um, which is in my written evidence. Um, Article 4, with regard to economic, social and cultural rights, state parties shall undertake such measures to the maximum extent of their available resources uh, where needed within the framework of international cooperation. That, that, that's really good. But do you want judges 
to be determining uh, uh, the maximum extent of states' available resources. That's not a judicial matter. That's a matter for uh, uh, social policy. That's a matter for the democratic process for parliaments to decide rather than for, for judges. And, and the UN Convention, it's full of good, good aspirations for government. It's also full of wide, broad statements which you cannot possibly ask judges to determine. Thank you very much. Uh, Liam? Just following up on that, I, I certainly um, appreciate the, the, the concerns and the basis for those concerns about incorporation. It's been put to us that there are um, countries who have incorporated the UNCRC into their domestic law. Um, is there anything from their experience that would um, substantiate the concerns that, that you have about the way in which that is then uh, applied? Or have, are there aspects of their legal systems that are different from ours to the extent that um, those, those concerns just don't arise? Yeah, I, I, I don't know of any problems that these countries have, have, have had. My understanding is that there's only a very tiny number, mm. um, three or four at the very most countries, that have, have uh, 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 brought this, this in, in, into the law. The United Kingdom historically has been, and what we call the common law countries, um, uh, have, have historically been uh, much more specific in the way that they design their legislation. European countries, for example, tend, tend to go for the grand statements and, and they leave it to the judges to work out what these statements mean. We, we don't tend to do that in our country. We, 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 we like our legislation to be much more specific so that people can understand very precisely what, what uh, uh, the parliament is trying to do and we leave it to the judges to give the proper interpretation with, with appropriate guidance. So I, I, I suspect countries that have interpreted, uh, that have incorporated the UN Convention are countries that, that are much more comfortable with legislative grand statements than we are. Um, good morning. I, could I just stay on the, the general principles of uh, the bill just now? Um, Professor Nori, you, you say in your uh, evidence that the point is that defining a person as a child increases the protections that the law offers them, but decreases their own personal uh, freedoms. You point to section 75 of the bill defining the child as a person who has not attained the age of 18, um, and that you would have been more comfortable with the limit of the child who was set at 16. Obviously, there are some issues there. Could you just expand on your concerns over that? Well, I, I suppose my, my, my general concern is, is, is that gro growing up is, is a gradual process. The law... <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, 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 <laughs> the law likes clear cut-off points. And in Scotland, we've, 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 we've always had a number of important ages mm -hmm. in which a child increases the ability to take control of their own life. The age of 12 is important because you can make a will after 12. You, you have a veto to uh, an adoption order from the age of 12, for example. Um, the age of 16 is obviously crucially important. It's the age of marriage. It's basically the age at which um, compulsory education uh, might, might come to an end. The age of 18 is actually less important and one, one of the few remaining uh, consequences of reaching the age of 18 is that you're allowed to vote and even that might not last in, at least in Scotland for terribly much, much, much longer. Um, the age of 25 is important. As the child increases in age, they increase in capacity and another way of saying that is that they increase in, in self-determination. They, they, they increase their, their, their right to make their own decisions and to, to determine how they're going to lead lead their own lives. The flip side of that is that the younger a child is, the more other people have control over them. So the balance has to be struck between protecting uh, uh, the vulnerable, protecting people who, who cannot protect themselves, and obviously a, 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 an infant needs full protection. But there comes a point when, when, when the child or young person um, it, it properly should be given the freedom to make their own mistakes. Now, traditionally, Scot Scotland has taken the view that 16 is 
yeah, slightly before that, it was the age of 12 and 40. That was put up to 16 in the 1920s. And since then, we've, we've had the age of 16 as, as the age at which we tend to regard children as free from adult interference. Can I just ask, would you prefer to have seen within the bill that the age was 16 rather than 18? I would much prefer the bill to, talk, to define child as a person up to the age of 16 and young person as a person between the age of 16 and whatever the upper limit, limit is to set. Now, that's slightly different from saying what then implications are there in being a young person, but I think it would be more, uh, uh, more coherent um, to stick to the age of 16 and say a child is a person under the age of 16. That, that's actually my, my next point, because I think you, you mentioned, and so did uh, a couple of other people in their responses, that it's about trying to change a culture it's not necessarily about trying to change the law. There's yeah. a culture of thinking that we're trying to develop behind this ambition of this bill. Do, do you feel that uh, the, the use of the terminology, uh, uh, particularly under a legal context, whether it's 16 or 18, do you feel that the use of that terminology is slightly um, complicating some aspects of this bill? I, I think it does. I think it's uncomfortable. There's, there's one, one of the examples I gave in my written evidence mm. um, was children in the armed services. Yeah. Now, children should not be in the armed services, Absolutely. but actually we don't really think they're children. We think they're young people. Mm. Well, if that's what we really think, why don't we call them young people? Mm. C could I just probe a little bit further, if I may, convener, um, on, on the question about how much could be achieved uh, without legislation and, and trying to adopt a, a, a new culture. Um, Mr Stevenson and Mrs Quinn, uh, in their evidence, talked about their concerns over the resources, that you feel that it would be very difficult to, to bring this in without very substantial uh, new resources um, in a wider dimension. Do you have any concerns that, by the bill as it stands just now, that we would actually be taking away some resources from the most vulnerable uh, children because we were trying to make it universal? Uh, is there a concern there? I, I mean, I think, to pick up on one point about the complexity, I think we, what we've seen is, what we so often see is that the, the, the big principles at the beginning, once it's all drafted and comes out the other end, has some unintended consequences, complexities. And there was something kind of really clear about the all-encompassing 95 Act when it, 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 it was brought in. Um, so that is an issue because you have all these other bits in it that, co that, that, that create complexities in terms of how you're going to deliver it and what does it mean when you deliver it. I'm not sure it will take uh, resources away because in order to, uh, immediately, in order to operate, it will need more resources. I mean, named persons will they, they must need more resources in order for people to have the time to do that uh, because it, it's not as if they're sitting around with, with space in their day. Um, my concern is, and, and you're talking about culture as well, there is, a, there is a different culture across different ages as to what they consider well-being to be and what they consider welfare to be. And some of the uh, living conditions that a social worker may see in their daily life and which they can assess to be good enough would not be viewed as such, perhaps, by a health visitor or, or by a teacher. Um, and the the difficulty we have with it is where do you draw that where are you drawing that line about thresholds? So there's a possibility that this could end up with an interference in people's family life at a very confused threshold as to what is a welfare problem, what is a well-being problem. Then you have the risk then that the resources are going into something that would be quite readily sorted through other methods, which could have been used. Um, at the high end. And just a final point on that, we will, as we already know from implementing GERFEC, pick up high-end stuff at an early stage that we don't pick up at the moment. Sorry, could I just have a point of clarification there? Mm. You, you made a very interesting point that um, the, the definition or the interpretations, I think you said, uh, mm. of welfare as opposed to well-being might be mm. different in different ages. Could, could you just elaborate on that? Um, and, and it's very difficult to do without giving, a, a, I suppose, a, an example. Um, and the, the the threshold, I think, for uh, many police officers and uh, social workers and health visitors who are regularly going into people's households, the threshold as to what is an acceptable right. family environment 
uh, can vary quite dramatically between them and what they believe to be the threshold where you intervene. So you would, you know, you would have uh, perhaps a situation where the, the, um, the household is not very clean, it's a bit mm. chaotic, uh, would seem to a social worker to not be very clean and a bit chaotic. It may seem to a police officer or someone else as somewhere where a child should not be brought up in. Okay. So, you, you know. In terms of um, the resource situation, it is back to the fact that work is ongoing in schools at this point. The, the issue of the named person, every establishment will have someone who is responsible for um, child protection, who will be responsible for additional support needs in, in terms of, of taking that forward and ensuring that the, the very best is given there. Whether that will change specifically very immediately in terms of the bill, <coughs> time will tell in, in relation to how much it takes hold of being responsible for every single child. Because a school would imagine that they're already got responsibility, a, a corporate parenting, if you like, for every single young person child that's within the establishment. Mm -hmm. But from establishment to establishment, depending on the number mm -hmm. of young people who meet the criteria for um, child protection or, or wider um, partnership working, um, or indeed in terms of additional support needs, that, that's where the differences often lie and where the resource implication in terms of what's new here will have, a, you know, have an impact. So if in the very in, in sort of beginnings, the very immediate resource, the additional resource will be in terms of additional training, just simply around whatever the, 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 new, the new document looks like, the new plan looks like, because whether we, whether we want to, to acknowledge that it's going to be one single document that sits within one system or not, or whether it's going to be a number that talk to each other, whatever way it is, for those people in our schools and, and educational establishments, there's going to be a training implication if it's going to change from what it currently is. So in, in, in the, 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 the right outset, that's what you need now. If we don't put an additional resource in to that, then one can only imagine that there's a knock-on effect for what currently happens because one person or more than one person within an establishment can only do what they do. And you can expand their day and their life to continue to take additional things in without taking things out unless you put a resource into it. So in the longer term, if, this, if, the, if the paperwork and the plans take away some of the bureaucracy that we've um, indicated in the past about, then that'll be a good thing and that will then mean that the resource can be used in a different way. But from the at the very beginning of, it, of a new scheme, um, you're going to need some. You're going to need additional resource, as has been indicated here, in order to make sure that you don't have an impact on what's going on elsewhere within your establishments. Thank you, uh, Liam. Very brief supplementary. Yeah, we've heard quite a bit about, and Susan's just articulated it very well in terms of the resource implications. And we've also heard from Professor Nori about um, the, the the risk inherent in uh, incorporation of UNCRC into domestic law. Uh, wholesale, but we've heard quite a bit of evidence from a range of stakeholders um, that the duties introduced through this bill are perhaps not as um, wide-ranging or significant as, as as many had hoped. Now, short of full incorporation, is that is that a view that others share? And and if so, where might those duties uh, be be strengthened? Professor Nori. Part one of the bill is is headed rights of children, and it's actually not, not an accurate description of what part one does. Part one imposes duties, and that's entirely appropriate. That's what legislation should do. And it imposes duties on Scottish ministers um, to uh, 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 make everybody aware and to keep reminding itself that it has to, uh, it has to take account of the UN Convention. That's, that, that's all to the good. But... It, it's a very. It's actually the wording in section one, subsection one, paragraph B, is very, very weak. It's got a, the, the Scottish ministers must keep under consideration whether to take any other steps 
and then, if they consider it appropriate to do so, take such such further steps. So they've, they've, they've to look at it and look at it. They've, they're legally obliged to look at it, and then it's completely up to them. It's completely within the discretion of the government whether they do anything about it. So that 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 weakens very substantially the duty that 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 is imposed. So even without incorporation, you could do very much more to strengthen the duties that are imposed in the bill. Okay. Specifics, obviously, the EIS have, have articulated our, our case in terms of um, those who are at preschool stage and the access to a GTC registered teacher. And I think that we would continue to wish to see something within the bill that strengthens and, and quantifies that in some way. Because without that, what we're seeing across the country um, is a, a clear reduction in the hours and the access to, to a teacher in the preschool stage. We work very closely with our colleagues within that, that sector and but continue to come back to the evidence which says that a quality early years education has to have a teacher or someone who's qualified with the, the pedagogy um, as part of their, their qualification and that with a 3 to 18 curriculum that makes that even clearer but that what the extension of the hours in terms of um, early years care and education doesn't do is make that access clear. So access at the moment in some of our, our areas simply means that a teacher passes through once a fortnight or once a month to check the plans that are in place and the young people never actually are taught by them in the terms that you would expect a primary one child or indeed somebody who are taking part in their qualifications to do. So we would continue to want to see that as a, as a much more specific aspect to, to, to contained within. I think there's also a point that social work raised about the, if, if it's about a protection of rights, um, particularly when you then start looking at aftercare and support beyond the age of 18 up to 25, 26, then where we're seeing much more decisive action being taken in relation to thresholds, in relation to children. What you're seeing across the country is obviously higher numbers of children being looked after and accommodated, and therefore the responsibility on us in terms of corporate parents uh, remains significant in terms of the financial implications as well. It's, it's just a, a particular point in terms of, of, of rights, and I think, they, yes, we were disappointed that the, the initial stuff that came out about the bill seemed to be stronger on the rights issue than it currently is in terms of the duty that's applied to that. But no matter what duty is applied at, at the level of ministers, the, the issue is what does it translate to into on the ground. Uh, and certainly the sense of our members is that children's rights, and especially in younger children whose welfare has been severely affected in one way or another, are not as up top front as they were maybe five, six, seven years ago. Um, the, the, the area has become much more litigious. Um, there is much more accent. Children's hearings are thinking first towards parents' rights in terms of contact rather than the children's rights. Those are things that seem real to us on the ground and I hear day in, day out. So the, the issue is not important though it is to have the duty at that level. And what we're suggesting in our response is whatever comes out of this, there needs to be some independent monitoring at the front line as to whether it's translating in reality uh, to the rights of children. And, and those are the basic ones to be protected um, are the most important for the younger ones. It's a different issue uh, for, for young people exercising rights to uh, aftercare to the services they're entitled to get and that kind of stuff. But we're talking for the ones that, in most circumstances, cannot speak up for themselves. Uh, Neil Bibby. Um, sorry about that. Um, the, um, just to follow up Liam MacArthur's question, um, I think around 15 children's charities and the Children's Commissioner um, have called on a child, children's rights impact assessment to be carried out um, on the bill. Um, I think that would appear 
um, a reasonable uh, request. And if the bill is about changing culture, it would appear that the Scottish Government could um, take, a, take a lead on that. Um, do you agree with um, the, the, the request for a, um, a children's rights impact assessment on, on the bill? We've certainly, Unison has certainly supported that position before, uh, and and we have uh, asked in some reorganisations in councils that they consider doing a children's rights impact assessment. I'm not aware of anyone that's actually done it, um, but there's, there's, the the commissioner's website has a very easy uh, to follow uh, system for doing such a thing, and uh, I think that's something that that we would align ourselves with for the need to work out what's going to happen on the ground as opposed to terms and principles. I mean, not Everybody has to answer. If you, don't, <laughs> if you agree with that, if you disagree, please speak up. But otherwise, if you're happy with that, then you don't have to answer. I mean, I think from the Association of Directors of Social, well, we would not be in any shape or form against that. I think um, within the body of social work practice, we would see that social workers are out there on the front line every day promoting and seeking to protect the rights of children. The bill um, highlights that, secures it, promotes it. I, I think the point's well made by John in terms of the, the, the current experience within the children's hearing system, and we would echo that. But um, again, it's not something that we would be against. Uh, Claire Adamson. Oh, th thank you, Kavira. Good morning. Um, I'd like to examine this sort of um, dichotomy between protecting privacy and promoting well-being. Um, that some of the issues have that have been raised in the evidence. Um, in relation to the name person, the bill uses the language of um, information that might be relevant to a child's well-being and ought to be shared. Um, and um, I think I think we would all agree that serious welfare concerns would be raised and shared with the named person, but it's an area of, of, of the general well-being of a young person and what implications that has for the decision makers in, on, on the ground who are actually working um, with families and young people about making the decision about when to share and what impact that, that level, potential level of information might have on services. That's something we're very concerned about because it's, it's on a day-to-day -day basis at the moment, it's very unclear for people as to what they can share and how they can share it and how much they can share it. Uh, and I think it's not clear to the people that we work with, the social workers in particular, uh, it's not clear to them how much of that information is shared. And the, the, the critical point, as we say in a response, I suppose, is that because of different thresholds, around for what might be acceptable parenting, what might be acceptable living. There will be different thresholds around for each professional as to what they think they should share. Um, and we're, we're in some circumstances almost at a situation of blanket information sharing, uh, particularly in child protection. And you can understand why that's the case, because people don't want, if there is a real risk to a child, they don't want to leave anything out that might be relevant. So everything is shared. Um, in practice, in, re, you know, in, in theory what should be shared is what needs to be shared for the purposes of, of what we're doing. Um, our concern about our, mem our members have is that with not enough guidance and a kind of woolly approach to this in a way, they're going to end up by default and to cover backs sharing stuff that isn't necessarily needed. That information is not necessarily needed. We, we have a situation at the moment if, you know, if there's a, a dispute in a household and uh, the police are called and the child isn't even there, that information would be transmitted to the school, to the social worker, to the health visitor, to the, you know, um, almost automatically. To what purpose? Not entirely sure sometimes. Uh, so there's that bit. There's also the the individual responsibility of social workers and until somebody, and I'm not aware of anybody having done this, and we say it for quite a long time, until somebody takes some kind of case in terms of data protection, it's almost like we're never going to know where the rule lies with this. Um, and, and that puts, I think many of our members are feeling somewhat at risk at, at that because of the tendency um, in, in recent years for uh, 
lawyers in particular to, to single out specific acts of social workers when they're doing appeals and stuff like that, where the social worker doesn't have any forum to reply to that kind of stuff. So people are worried about that. And I think the, the, the concern um, that was around before that not enough information was being shared uh, is legitimate. But we need some kind of guidance as to whether you need to share everything or what bits you need to share. And I think that's going to be very, very difficult. I think in addition to the, the what, it is then about the consistency, because the example given that, you know, there's a, a position now where even if, if the police are called, even if the child's there, it'll be shared with the, the school automatically. I think that's a threshold in some areas of the country and in other areas it's not. Mm -hmm. So it's not what you would automatically see in, in some... So what needs to be clear coming out of this in, in terms of the training for all of the, 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 the groups involved is what, what is appropriate to be shared at different levels of, of intervention, but making sure then that that, is shared, that threshold is what's shared across the country so you're not in a position where... Um, in, a, in a particular area of a city because there's a much higher incident um, of, of police intervention in, in family disputes than perhaps in, in, in another part of the country. It's not shared there automatically because of workload or a threshold or otherwise, but it might well be automatically somewhere else. So it's the two parts hand in hand. You need, the, you need to have the threshold but you need to have that consistently applied across the country so that a, a teacher in Shetland will know to share the same kind of information as a teacher in, in the northeast of Glasgow, will know to share the same information as pe someone working in Scottish borders so that we get that, that kind of consistency because children move around the country, families move around the country, and indeed we've quite often within education seem to see that our most vulnerable children are the ones who will move most often within the education system for one reason or another. So thresholds need to be there, but actually consistency. And, and that will only come with training. That will only come with, with, with joined up training with, with all of the organisations so that we, we all hear the, the, say, the same messages. And that's really hard to, to deliver. I think the point's well made in terms of it being proportionate, um, and I think practice within Scotland at the moment is proportionate, and I think that within localities, I think there's a real attempt on occasions to reflect on thresholds and reflect on the process critically between health visitors, early years educators, and, 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 and social work. And social work would be very clear, certainly the association is that social work is not the panacea. And, and nor is social work seeking to be involved inappropriately in individuals' lives. And in actual fact, the issue of highlighting, which the Act endeavours to do in relation to moving from child protection to children's concern, is about actually saying we need to be intervening earlier. We need to be intervening in a way where parents are exercising a degree of informed choice and they're, not, they're in a position to, to draw down as getting it right for every child endeavours to do, to have a single system that draws down support at an early stage to that child. And that may not involve social work. And therefore, what you're seeing is a much more proactive, much more earlier intervention, much more assertive outreach approach to bringing um, assistance to children, to nipping problems in the bud, to actually saying that we are providing critical support to parents at an early stage in a way that is, um, in a sense, open. It's, 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 it's part of a modern society. So I think that, the, you know, we, we would welcome that and we would welcome then as it moves into the role of the, the named worker. This may conceptually be the most difficult part of this whole bill. It's, it, 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 it strikes me and it taps into a number of issues which we've already talked about when I was uh, uh, answering Liz Smith's question um, about children and young young people. Both children and young people are entitled to privacy. They're entitled to confidentiality. And the older they are, the more important that is for 
for each individual. It also illustrates um, I, 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 the, 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 the huge ambiguities in the drafting of the bill, which, if, if it's passed in its form, will only lead to lots and lots of litigation, which might be good for lawyers, but not necessarily good for children and young people. Uh, uh, section 26, service provider or rele relevant authority must provide uh, in, in information. Information if it might be relevant and it ought to be provided. It must provide if it might be relevant and ought to be provided. Um, these are all contradictory contradictory words and you're leaving it to the courts to strike the balance of where, 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 where that is to be. Um, then you've got section 27, uh, which, which is the worst section in, in, in this bill. And if you, if, if you simply uh, uh, strike it out, and leave everything else, will have achieved quite a lot. Section 27 says the provision of information under this bill is not to be taken to breach any prohibition or restriction on the disclosure of information. It's not to be taken to breach any prohibition. This, this trumps every other piece of legislation from this parliament or, or any other parliament that provides law for Scotland. Um, in, anywhere. If, if, if you remember just two years ago with the Children's Hearing Scotland Act, now, now Act and now, now in force, there's a very strong prohibition on publishing information about children that appear before children's hearings because children are entitled to confidentiality. And this, this if, if it's disclosed within the very ambiguous um, parameters of this bill, that's OK. Well, it isn't OK. Thank you very much. Quick supplementary. Well, uh, well, quick supplementary and quick answers from the panel. <laughs> we've, got a lot, we've got a lot to get through. I'm keen it, to get it, through. it was just, um, obviously, Professor Norrie, you would like to see change into the drafting of the bill to, 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 to do this, but how, how important will... will well, guidelines, but could, could guidelines actually deal with a lot of the ambiguities at this stage? The problem with leaving it all to guidelines in the bill that it is, 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 is that the legislation is what will lead to court cases. And it will be the interpretation of the legislation, not the interpretation of guidance, that gives rise to litigation. Okay. Okay, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask a quick supplementary <laughs> as well, <laughs> just while you sense your view. Is it your view, I mean, very quickly, um, that the bill on, on the kind of points you've just raised um, is fundamentally unsound, or is it minor drafting? The bill is fundamentally sound. The bill, bill has good aspirations for government, for public services, um, for Scottish society. So it's amendments to the drafting because of the particular ambiguity of the language that's being used? I, I, that would be my primary yes. concern, yes. Yeah. I think um, I would agree. I think that what it does, however, is expose a long-term problem and not one that just arises from this bill. Uh, and part of that is children's privacy uh, when they're quite young, too. And, you know, it's not unusual for a victim in terms of a crime, the child who is the victim, for the files to be requisitioned by the procurator, fiscal, by the police and all the rest to see everything about that child. Now, the, 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 we, we have to start thinking uh, you know, a bit hard about how children exercise their right to privacy in a safe way. And there are so much confusion about it across all of the legislation uh, covering children's services. Neil Libby. I just wanted to ask about the issue of, of resources and um, the named person, which I think we've, we've already um, kind of touched on. Um, I know the EIS have... I've said that uh, there's a need for resources for uh, public sector to pursue the intentions of the Children and Young People Bill when uh, financial constraints and local authorities lead to barriers to effective partnerships. Uh, I know Unison have already said staff workload, uh, lack of resources, an impediment to GERFIC, um, and there's a need for to increase frontline um, staff. Um, is it fair to say you, you don't believe there is enough resources to realise the, the ambitions of of this bill. It's fair to say that we're made very concerned about the, the, the possibilities of that because part of within this within our schools the, the named person isn't 
named at the moment in terms of, the, but they're doing the job. The job is already there. It'll be the same with our, our social work colleagues. People are doing these jobs already, but what we've indicated is that that person within a school, that will not be their sole job. That won't be their single one job. If it's the if it's the head teacher of a primary school, they've got the the whole of the school to oversee a lot financially, teaching and learning, development of staff, all the rest of it. If it's a, a deputy head or a, a pastoral care teacher or whoever within a, a secondary sector, they will have teaching duties. They will have um, other other remits that will be part of their. It won't be any. It will be very unusual. If a school was to say, you're the named person and we recognise that that's a huge job because 25% of our young people are, are involved within um, stage three and stage four of, of intervention and therefore that's too big a job for you to have anything else to do because they just won't have the resources to do that. So your crunch point comes where you're saying, if, if, there, has to, if you ha there has to be an attendance at a meeting and the meeting's called when it clashes with a teaching commitment of the, the named person and you can't deliver it, the school doesn't have someone to cover that. You know, what, what's, the, what's the crunch there? Do you attend the meeting and the class that's left behind doesn't have somebody teaching them? Do you have... What, what happens now? Because that, that, must ha that must happen at the moment. Well... At the moment, up until very recently, you would have had a, a supply teacher who would be able to come in and do it. And unfortunately, that's a whole different debate at the moment. But there are, there, it will be covered internally or otherwise. But if the duties become more, as, as is possible here, and become clearer within it, then there will be problems there. And I think our concern is that up until now, as, as the impact of the cuts and the impact of resources take a bite within our establishment, schools are seeing it much more difficult. So what's happened before is that a senior management team in a secondary school would not have class commitments on a routine basis and, in fact, would very rarely actually be called upon to do a please take. But what we've are evidencing now is that more and more they are. So the, the teaching duties, the teaching commitments of all of the, the members within a school are becoming tighter and therefore that has an impact for what you can do beyond it. I think one of the other things we raised within it in terms of the name person and certainly was, was concerned is what happens beyond um, the, 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 the school year so you get into the holiday period and otherwise um, I know it's been a a great cause of concern in my own in times in my in my head teacher job, if I, if I you know if a uh, hearing is is routinely going to be there, then you know where does the you know, where does the resource come from to to overtake that kind of part? So, I think yeah we we do have concerns that the squeezing at the moment it's it, we need the new resources in order to get the training and things in place for the for the changes to the bill. But what our schools and establishments are seeing at the moment is a much, much tighter budget in terms of the people that are there and therefore a, a, a conflict in where their duties lie. Um, and related to that, I think I understand the Scottish Government have said for school staff it is expected that after initial training there will be no increased time commitment. What, what would you what would you say to the Scottish government in response to that? Well, what I would say is that there may there, if if there is no increased time commitment, that's fine. If you're working on the same resource that you were working on five years ago, ten years ago, but what we're saying is we're not working on the same resource. So schools are as the same as other areas, squeezed in terms of what they can deliver. In relation to this, you know, in relation to the school day and and beyond, so if there's no increase in duties and you keep the resource level at the same level as it was previously, fine. We'd still like to see more. Of course, we would. We're a, we're, we're a, an organisation, and otherwise, that we would all want to see see more. But what we're not—that's not the case. What we're seeing is 
it's tighter, it's harder to within our establishments. So, and again, only time will tell whether or not there's an increased um, an increased level of work that has to, that goes with this because we won't know until what's actually there and until we actually see it. There's also an assumption that the earlier intervention is less intense. Um, and in an actual fact, what, what we are seeing on, on the ground is that although uh, most welcome that it is, that you, you, you're actually seeing the emergence and referral on of, of, of earlier difficulties, there no, it's no less intense in an actual fact to still address it and, and, and divert and, and actually secure better outcomes for children it, it actually involves significant additional resource on occasions. Just beginning to feel that my exit from this committee is rather timely because uh, <laughs> I, I think I feel a blizzard of amendments coming uh, similar to the post-16 bill. So uh, good luck. Um, and looking at the uh, the comments on the financial memorandum, uh, it says that um, the role of the named person described in the bill will result in an extra two hours per child from midwives, one hour per child from health visitors. Now, I'm not very good at maths, but I think I've worked it out that for uh, midwives that will mean two and a half minutes a week and just over a minute for health visitors. What is that going to contribute? We've already said that it's going to require significant input in terms of resources for, for health visitors, for health staff. I mean, we're already in a position where health visitors are well overworked. Um, the, the ability to the, the focusing, the refocusing health visiting towards the most vulnerable, uh, that then missed out on things like you know your two-year check, which uh, ended up in lots of developmental issues not being picked up. Then the reintroduction of that, um, but not with the resources alongside it. Then this on top, I think it's it, it, it almost critical for health visitors and uh, and midwives on the ground. So the the where we're working it already, and we're aware. That in Edinburgh, certainly the pilots or the, have been with preschool children. When that's working already, people find it a bit of difficulty getting their head around it. But once they've got their head around it, they're fine. What you're then stuck with is the lack of time to do that. And as a named person, and the size of caseloads of health visitors have, they could be attending several meetings a week in terms of children. Um, which is all time that they're not out visiting children. So it will need a significant investment of resources that's not just a one-off, but will be an ongoing one. It's took you longer to give me that answer than they will have each week to <laughs> address this. That's the reality yeah. of the situation. But, but they are going to be time-rich compared to teachers because apparently they won't need any extra time. Now, I, on a basic level, I find that incredible that that is actually said because if I train you to do something and then you go and do it, it must take some time. Or maybe we need Professor Hawkins or somebody before us to explain the physics of doing something which doesn't take any time. Surely for teachers this, you know, it must take time. And I think what is probably reflected there, Neil, is that much of what already goes on in schools will be confined, will be what we're being trained to, to put into the in, in terms of the bill. But it does take time. And the difficulty we have is that um, people will, it, in the very beginning, become possibly more concerned or more afraid of the litigation stuff that's there. And therefore, that does take more time and traits in just in embedding any new legislation and embedding any new processes or otherwise to make sure that um, that happens. And again, we would argue that it does take time. It's already taken time, and that's why it's not going to take any additional. But that's not that's not necessarily resourced with it, you know. And, and again, I think we have to consider how we resource our schools and and, and particularly staff our schools in terms of need across the country because over the years things have changed in terms of the recognition that's given to staffing levels in schools who are, are, are in areas with 
who are high on the index of multiple deprivation or the, you know, and the move to using um, the free school meals, clothing grants, entitlement as the, the factor, the, the fraction that's factored in rather than index of deprivation or otherwise, because that changes quite significantly the resource that our schools um, get in terms of the staffing levels for it. And whilst that's not the only thing that will determine the level of need and the workload of a named person, it's quite clear that it has a, that that does have an impact. So, I would probably suggest that the, it may well be that there's not any additional work, but it's that's not the reality. The reality is that the, actually the work's ongoing. As I've said before, it's only the one part of the job that the named person will be doing. There won't be much in all as some of some of my colleagues might like a named person who's only doing that job. They'll be doing a whole plethora of other things in relation to the, the well-being and the teaching and learning and otherwise of the, the young people, and that will become part of it. Whether that becomes overwhelming in terms of their workload will de really does depend on the makeup and the, the kind of, the, of their, their establishment at any one time. And that's it, you know, so your, your schools might see a greater need, you know, one year and then, it change, you know, it changes. And I think that's where it, it's difficult. And we would argue again that that has been squeezed over the years in terms of, of the, the roles that people have. Where a, where a secondary school may have had five deputy heads in the past, they may well only have three now. So those three have a bigger, bigger load than they had when there were five. Just uh, you know, in some of the large secondary schools, you're talking about roles of you know a few thousand, um, and you know we'd really try to say that it, there will be a named person in that school responsible for say up to three thousand young people, and that's not going to take any extra time. I'm sorry, I just don't wear that at all. Can I just clarify, given that line of questioning or the statements? Um, I presume much of this work, or as I think you've indicated, already goes on. We have pastoral <coughs> care, uh, teachers who take on that role as part of their current duties. Um, is it not the case that what we're doing here effectively is, is quantifying um, and focusing that responsibility um, uh, more accurately and detailing what that role is to ensure that what already happens with, with good teachers it happens across the country. Is that is that not what we're doing here? Or attempting to do? It may well it may well be the intention of, of what's there, but the impact then of that um, will will only only time will tell and only time will see whether or not that's there because the actual detail of the duties of the named person is 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 massive. And as I say, it's not just the impact of this bill and its and its own right in terms of whether it comes with no additional resource, you have to then set that in the context that our establishments are finding themselves in just now. And so, yes, we do have pastoral care, but in lots of areas, that their role has changed over the years and their teaching commitment has increased in recent <coughs> years compared to what it was in the past. And so the knock-on, so it's only time will tell whether or not the duties of the, the named person simply quantify what's currently happening or indeed increase the workload of there. We, don't, we won't know until we see what it looks like in the ground. OK, thank, thank you very much. I, I, time's rushing on, so I need to move on. Colin, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. I'd like to touch again on a, a, a point that was actually raised by Professor, Professor Norrie um, in connection with a, a single child's plan. Uh, the bill provides for a ch child's plan to be developed if uh, an individual child has a well-being need and requires targeted intervention. Now, Professor Norrie indicated that uh, there were some deficiencies there and that guidelines, if laid down by the government, would not compensate for these because the bill doesn't make any reference to existing legislative duties. Now, I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about that and, and, and whether the whole panel agrees on that. Professor Norrie? The point I was making in my, my 
written evidence, if that's the, 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 the part that you're referring to, um, is, is, is taking account, when do you take account of the child's views? And the bill suggests that you take account of the child's views when deciding whether a children's plan is necessary. It struck me that it was much more important to take account of the child's views when you're designing the content of the child's plan. But it, 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 it taps into a, a, a slightly broader concern I had a, a, a concerning children's views. Most of the, the, the child law that, that we've had for the past 20 or 30 years um, has a, a, a tracing the, this, this duty from Article 12 of the UN Convention. Most of our child law legislation specifically requires um, bodies to take account of the views of the child. And it, it struck me reading this bill that there's, there's very, very little of that in this bill. Um, and I, I, I should have preferred rather more a, 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 a detail about a, 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 the requirement that service providers in drawing up not only the children's plans but the, the, the general um, um, strategies, um, I, 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 I should have preferred more of a requirement that, that, that they speak to children, find out what children need in particular areas. I appreciate that comment, but uh, you know, we have existing legislative requirements. Do they adequately feed into this bill and uh, with no specific reference to them, will guidelines compensate for that? Guide, guidelines in, 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 in that context, I, th I think guide, guidelines do, do serve a useful purpose. I mean, I've, again, I would probably see that core social work practice and core what it is that we do when we're working with children has to have at its very heart the view of the child and the single plan or any plan um, is most effective when its focus is specifically on what the child needs. So I would, I would see that as being something that there are sufficient safeguards, I think, in the system through um, child protection reviews, between looked after and accommodated reviews, between relationships with schools and health visitors and also then the children's hearing system itself to make sure that as core practice we are we are seeking when, whether it's looking at the issue to do with well-being or welfare is, is, is actually saying at its very core, at its very heart has got to be um, that, that securing of the child's view um, irrespective of their age or even, even where you're talking about children that are very young the, the, the professional social worker and those other professionals that are around the child are obliged to think empathically about the needs of that child and, 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 and convert some of those absolute needs into, in, in, into the plan. I think that in terms of, of the plan, you know, and the idea that it's that it's a single plan in terms of well-being, I mean, again, we've, we've raised the issue that, you know, education will have um, single plans and uh, plans which are relate to additional support needs that may not be related to well-being. And we would hope that actually what this would do is, is, is free us up of the fact that we have different plans for different different things. And I don't think that's, you know, the potentials there in this point, if it's just simply about well-being. The, the current um, Additional Support Needs Act does allow, does allow and does contain within it the need to have the young person's voice heard within their plan. And that's, that's there and that's used and developed within our schools. I think what we kind of hope is that actually what we'll not have is a plan that looks one way if you're, you're, you're concerned about well-being, but a different looking one in terms of educational need for, you know, for additional support needs. We, we really hope that it will be a single document that should a young person have a, a need for a plan in relation to um, overtaking educational barriers to learning as opposed to well-being barriers to learning, it would look the same. It would be the same document so that if anything changes in the young person's life, you're not having to 
re redraft the whole thing just simply to provide that information. And I think that needs to be clearer there in terms of what, what would be expected. Because in our terms, if that's not what comes out, if it's simply that there's a single plan that relates to where, it, where there's a concern about wellbeing, then it's not going to change... It's not going to change the workload of my members because they're going, still going to have a separate plan in terms of additional support needs act, and we'd hope that the two would start to start to look the same. I think the issue for us was the sharing without consent in terms of information. How you define that in wellbeing? Good practices you share with consent and you engage people in the process. And if you start off from a process with a child where you've excluded them from the decision as to share their information or not, uh, then you're, you're in a bit of an uphill struggle when you take the next step. I think it's a very important point made by ADSW in, in the response for today, and that was the one about advocacy, because children's views require, children require someone to assist them in communicating their views or assist them in interpreting their views. And there seems that's that's nuts and bolts of what social workers do every day. Uh, they must have that in a report. Uh, the, the, in my own area, there's the, uh, the tenet that no child should never be in a report that the child's too young to express a view. Children express views in all sorts of ways uh, that we need to interpret. There's a kind of industry and adversary coming up uh, that, that if you you know you must have an advocate uh, in order to express your views and that kind of stuff. We need to look at that not being a separate structure, but something that is ground into every part of the structure uh, from its roots upwards. And we're looking at a system here that's taking a universal approach to the well-being of children, using services, by and large, that have been targeted in the past, that the health visitor service, the social work services kind of things, only serve a part of the population. So the schools issue that serve the whole population. It's a major issue for them and we need to get our heads around this universality that we're, we're providing here, which will bring a whole lot of people into that net that had no connection with these agencies at all in the past. From your past experience on this, do you think that uh, the practical issues around combining the child's plan with other existing plans might, be, might turn out to be a bigger issue than we think? I think that we... It, in previous evidence for previous legislation, Unison has made the point that I think at one point we discovered that for a child to come into care in one authority, there was something like 11 different forms that needed to be done. Uh, now, that, that has got much better. But we've also guarded against the, the oversimplifying of a single child's plan because the temptation in all these things is to come up with a bureaucracy around it and a form around it and a form that is so simplistic that it tells you nothing. And what we need is the pooling together in a single child's plan of all the specialist plans. You wouldn't expect a paediatrician's report to be able to be done on a single sheet of paper. You wouldn't expect a, an educational plan to be done in that kind of way. This, the single child's plan needs to be a hub where these are brought together and not replaced. And unfortunately, sometimes what we see on the ground is an, a, an attempt to replace that with something far more simplistic. Do you think there's enough clarity about which organisation might be responsible for providing and for paying for the services under the child's plan? I'm thinking here maybe where children use services outside the, their own local authority. I mean, I think that, again, within, um, within current practice, and again, if, if we're actually seeing that this bill is capturing current practice, those are, those are well-established arrangements in which... Um, again, the team of professionals. There are very, you know, I, I can't think that there is significant dispute. There is often clarity, and 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 often the the professionals themselves need to work together to be absolutely clear where that where that child's needs is best served in terms of the local resources that are at, at, at their disposal. I think it works well at the moment. Very much, uh, Neil Finlay. Yeah, just on the plans and uh, in the previous job, I was involved in writing individual education plans, and uh, it was probably the hardest couple of weeks of the year when you had to refresh them because it's you know it's really really uh, time consuming and, and and very difficult at times. Um, uh, when I first uh, went into the job, um, they were written in very um, dry 
educational terminology and spoke about you know numeracy and phonics and linguistics and all the rest of it. Um, these were then sent to parents for to sign off and agree. Many of the parents had not a clue what they were about, not a clue. They would come back signed, but if you were actually to get into the discussion with the parents about what, what they were signing, you know, uh, they, they didn't particularly know. And it wasn't until the school actually completely revamped that and, and wrote the plan alongside the child, who then said, I can do this, I can do that, but I, I need diff uh, help with this, that, or the next thing, that both the child and the parents began to realise what it was all about. Um, and it was very, very refreshing to see. I, I, I listened to your caution, John, about making it overly simplistic, but if we're trying to get buy-in for the people who are supposed to be being assisted by this, then we have to have a whole rethink about how we actually engage them and get, get them buy-in into that in the first place. So simplifying it doesn't necessarily mean you're throwing a lot, a lot of information, but it has to be presented in a way that people understand what's being said those changes to how plans within school are now developed are the reason and it's the fact that we have gone to that stage where we do involve parents and young people on a face-to-face -face basis we already do that and that's one of the real challenges just now because you have to do that during the school day you can't do that with you can't you can't just go go and wait behind, will you, so that I can sit down with because I've had to take the class today. Uh -huh. So the plan, you know, and that's one that you know that is a real challenge for schools where um, you gave the example of, of large secondaries with large numbers. I would suggest that actually some of our smaller schools are even mm -hmm. more challenged because very often they won't have, um, you know, if you've got a teaching head. Okay, it might be a small number of young people, but if you're if you're teaching during the day, you can't sit down with a young person and take their views, or sit down with the parent and take their views on a on a plan. You, you've got people in front of you, so there are real challenges already that exist within the system that we have. That it doesn't matter what, particularly what the paperwork looks like. You actually need to physically have time without a class in front of you in order to be able to do that. And I think that's where our members certainly have said in the last few years, it's become harder to, to, to find that time within the school day to do it. And those are the things that you have to do during the school day. Yes, you can sit with the class teacher at the end of the, the day or the beginning of the day or whenever and develop their strategies and whatever. But the parts where you are actually involving young people needs to take place when they are there within the school day or else you're asking our most vulnerable children to stay behind and get a detention so that we can do, we can do your we can work on what your support needs are and that's that's just not that's where the squeezing in terms of people having to to their role bigger than, than that does have the impact I suppose the point about the, and it goes back to maybe the first point, the law by itself and the plan by itself won't deliver the cultural change that we're looking for. And it's the, it's the ethos and thinking behind the act and particularly um, getting it right for every child, which is about um, that, that set of attributes that without doubt early years educators bring, health visitors bring. Um, you know, the third sector are critical in that in terms of early engagement and that's where I get again the bit about saying a social worker by itself filling in a, a, a plan, filling in a report won't actually get the engagement and, and, and secure the outcomes. It's about that, that set of attributes and that quality that's, that, that's really critical as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Marco Biagi. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask about the difference between welfare and well-being, which has been touched on quite a bit uh, already. Uh, feel free to give yes-no answers as well, because I'm aware of the, the time. Um, the written submission from Professor Norrie characterised the difference as being welfare being very imperative, almost a tripwire to trigger intervention, whereas well-being is much uh, broader and about maximising 
good things about a child's life. Is that something you would agree with as a characterisation of the other members of the panel? Well, actually, firstly, Professor Norrie, is that a fair characterisation? <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 it is a fair uh, uh, summation in my, my, my view, but I think the, 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 critical, the critical distinction is that the law has traditionally used the welfare test when the state is stepping in and compulsorily doing something, interfering with family life, if you want to put it that way. Well, the, the, the bill, as far as I understand it, is more about avoiding the need for compulsory state intervention. And that's a quite different process. And it, it's using a different word. It's using the word well-being instead of a, a, a welfare. And it struck me that that was quite a useful use of language. Since I got that right, uh, Mike Burns, do you agree that it's a it's helpful, and I think it's 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 it's, it's I think also critical for us in Scotland that to actually deal with some of the issues that we've got in relation to welfare. If you take child protection, we need to enhance well-being, and we need to, as a collective community, we need to parent better, and we need to actually see parent as parenting as being a kind of active citizenship. And I appreciate the point that's been made about. Um, the differentiation about family life and the, the privacy and the protection of family life, I absolutely um, adhere to that. But I think it's important equally that we deal with a lot of situations that have ended up being child protection, they've ended up being at the very um, acute stage when what happened was we could have intervened. The system collectively should have, could have and should have intervened earlier on the issue of well-being. Is there any disagreement from the other two members? Only in terms of how we define and where the threshold is. We said earlier on, what, what, what is that? And that's going to end up being tested somewhere in the same way as welfare. It continues to be tested uh, through lawyers arguing with each other more and more at children's hearings. But the principle, no. Other than, other than the, the compulsory sharing of information, because that is a state intervention at that stage on wellbeing. And in terms of the duty to uh, promote well-being, do you believe it complements or conflicts with other duties, for example, corporate parenting and supporting and promoting welfare? No. No. All Don't works. No. And uh, lastly, one of the things that had come up in the, the written evidence was some comment on the use of Shinari as uh, a set of indicators for this. Is this something that any of you would have any comment on? Unison commented on the use of, of Shinari, not in terms of whether Shinari wasn't good indicators or not, but it was the it was the issue of those being the possibility of thresholds being considerably blurred as to what one person's understanding of that being a good thing or not such a good thing might be. And that's the area that we have the concern about, where something that should be enabling, involving, um, and, and the point that was made earlier, uh, Benil, in terms of forms, they, they, they are much better when people are involved at the beginning of that. If if you're seeking to involve people, um, the best way to do that is is through cooperation. And if we start, if we get into a process where that becomes a kind of official dump for, for, for sharing information. We've lost them at the beginning. In terms of Shinari, I suppose my only caution is that to, in terms of considering changing it, people within the schools are only getting to grips with them currently as they are. And if you suddenly come along and say, well, actually, even before you've started using these to do anything very much, we're going to change them. Their heads might explode um, because they are. It's that thing. <laughs> but the, because the problem is, you know, the, the Shinari within Gurfet has taken a while mm. to to permeate through a lot of our systems, and I think so, they serve us in terms of the kind of generalities. But you need to. There are other aspects to it that will give you the much more precise and considered interventions and, and what's there. Would it be fair to say then that putting the, each of the Shinari indicators into the legislation is that the headings would provide a, a level of confidence that that's the system that's going to be used and there's no danger of anyone's head exploding in the near future? <laughs>
Yeah, I suppose that within, if they're within the legislation, it's back to the whether or not it, it needs to be within the legislation mm. or within, whether it's within the guidance. And I suppose in terms of of the guidance, as long as it's clear within the guidance that comes with it that that's what's there, then that will give people within our schools certainly the confidence that that's where we're going in the future. Um, they, they match very much to what we're doing within the curriculum and, and other aspects of their work. And so people are will, be, will begin to gain confidence in their use. They're not the, the, the be-all and end-all of the assessment tools and plans or, or the, the only parts that are considered within um, getting it right and so there would only be one part to it um, in terms of what schools would use. George Adam. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning. I would just like to ask a question with regards to kinship care. It's probably more for Mike Burns. And uh, I know it's a massive issue and I know the challenges involved at a local authority level and the difficulties family have families have actually within the system trying to navigate the administrative minefield that, uh, that is put before them. But can I ask uh, what discretion should the local authorities have in the way they support kinship carers and to what level? I think that, that, that obviously in our submission we've seen um, a, a very positive uh, contribution from kinship carers and the securing of kinship carers in terms of the financial support um, that, that, that they've been given. Um, I do think that we've said what is critical is rather than um, the, the Act talking about counselling is that in a sense it should be much more assessed need and it should be much more assessed need um, alongside kinship carers and, al and also alongside a lot of the informal supports that kinship carers um, have and, 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 and on occasions have access to. I know that within um, three of the cities that b big effort has been made, just that point that you're making about trying to um, facilitate um, um, that, that path to support. Um, and I think a lot of the time carers, certainly that I speak to on a local level, have said that in, on occasions it's almost like they have to break down barriers to get um, on occasions to support, whether that's even in a sense, you know, regarding welfare rights or regarding some of the legal. And I think what we've been looking at doing is basically providing much more um, assistance and much quicker um, access to support. So I think that, that, I think that there should be um, significant local determination about what is required within an area. I know that kinship car carers themselves have looked at a number of things. Yes, it can be to do with with counselling and it can be to do with trauma and it can be to do with, with, with loss. But also there can be significant issues are, around establishing routines about mealtime, about sleep, about um, sometimes family group conferencing, also at times issues around contact. So I think, I, I, I think the notion of being um, too prescriptive may in a sense narrow um, what is required for that child rather than in a sense simply saying it's part of the assessed need and, 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 and some of the principles that we've, sp we've, we've spoken about. You mentioned uh, welfare rights and uh, some of the th nine times out of ten it becomes quite difficult for whoever is the kinship carer to, to actually look after the family financially to deal with it and uh, obviously the system is we've both agreed that it's quite difficult for them to go through but when do you think, uh, if the, the actual uh, benefit system doesn't support the families uh, financially, do you think the local authorities have the right to step in and actually support them at that stage? I know that a number of the authorities have, have provided kinship care payments specifically on the basis that they protect access to the current um, payments that would be, weighed, be made for the, with the, the, the DWP, etc. So I think that there is probably at the moment we still have a degree of um, postcode lottery with a, with, with, with a number of differences and some of that was down to the fact that some local authorities went down the route of being able to, in a sense, see them as similar to to foster carers where I think other authorities were very clear saying there was something very different here and that what we needed to do was basically ensure that that financial burden wasn't in a sense then simply uh, being assumed by the local authority and that finances that would have been available to them were protected and then indeed enhanced 
if the local authority, and it goes back to all the discussion that we've, we've had about uh, the protection of pri private life, is where, where the local authority has made a decision that that child cannot, in the circumstances, remain with the parents, that issue about threshold, and is then making an intervention to say the child should move, whether it's to the aunt, to the uncle, or to the grandparents, then at that point, um, I think the kinship care payment should be made, and I think um, the kinship care payment um, has been um, a, a, a significant contribution to supporting those children. And we've looked at things even in terms of audit that a lot of those children have then remained within their extended family with that that payment, and I think that that's something to be to be really welcomed. Okay, thank you. Well, one final question from uh, Neil Bivy. Thanks, Camino. I just wanted to uh, ask the ADSW about um, your submission. You mentioned um, at the start of your sub uh, submission about the removal of functions and uh, what you interpreted as a, a very centralising power uh, which could take away planning for children's services um, and the transferring of uh, assets and money uh, from local authorities to a joint uh, body or, or, or joint board. Just to briefly ask you, um, what, what case has the Scottish Government made to you um, for the, the need to do that? Well, I, th I think that, I mean, I suppose one of the things that we commented on was the, the fact that it, it, it didn't form part of the consultation. And I think that um, where we wanted to flag it was the fact that um, a lot of the work that the Scottish Government has led on in relation to the Early Years Collaborative, which really does um, encapture the GIRFEC principles, it, it captures the direction of travel within the Act, is actually saying that what we need to do is we need to specifically look at communities, we need to look at neighbourhoods, and we, we need to look at the access to services, the point that we're raising there in relation to kinship care, the point that we've raised about bringing um, local resources to local people. So even within my own local authority, which is, which is Glasgow, at times you have this notion of the centralised plan, but what remains critical for me is my ability to convert that in to what it means in Postle, what it means in Drumchapel. And I think all we were flagging up is the fact that a lot of the time it's not the deficit. Where, where, where the deficit is in performance, it's not often around the quality of the plan. I've looked at a lot of plans within Scotland. They're incredibly well written. They've got a lot of bright people at the back of them. They're excellent in terms of their, their aspirations and what they want for children. The criticality is converting those aspirations into tangible outcomes on the ground and in local neighbourhoods. And I think we were so simply flagging that up as a point as to say it seemed incongruent in the direction of travel of the Early Years Collaborative and the GIRFEC principles to then be saying that there will be at times a centralised solution to what, to, to what might be, in, in, in a sense, lo local determination and local issues. That was our issue. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, can I thank all witnesses very much for this morning. That's really the start of our uh, in-depth look at the bill, um, and it's been a very helpful start um, uh, this morning. And I, once again, can I thank you for the written evidence you also supplied to the committee uh, before your appearance this morning. Uh, the committee uh, agreed earlier to take agenda item three in private, so therefore that concludes the public part of the meeting, and we now move into private session.